Hey, it's Jay. Let's get right into episode three. What is this is audio from a reality television show in South Korea entitled Meeting You. Uh, let me try to describe what's happening. A woman is wearing a virtual reality headset and a pair of gloves equipped with sensors. In her headset is an immersive virtual experience. A little girl stands in front of her. They both say that they miss each other. The little girl asks her mom to hold out her hand. And when she does, they both begin to float towards the sky. They float down and land in a misty area with a picnic table. A birthday cake is set up and the woman places virtual candles and a virtual cake. They sing a birthday song. In the non-virtual world on the show, the woman's family is watching her go through this experience on a sound stage in front of a green screen. The young girl in the virtual world is a representation of Na Yong, who died of an illness at seven years old. Her voice, image, and mannerisms in the simulation are constructed using her actual photographs and voice recordings. Her sisters and father watch as her mother goes through this virtual experience. Everyone is crying. The experience ends with the virtual Na Young laying down on a bed, going to sleep, and morphing into a kind of glowing butterfly that flutters up into a virtual sky. This clip of, uh, of the show went a little viral online a while back, and the response was extremely strong on both sides. There were those who were filled with awe and intrigue and thought it was beautiful, and others who were horrified and disgusted by the entire thing. Uh, you can count me in as one of the people who found the show of the clip incredible and inspiring. Uh, but of course, there is also a lot of danger and different kinds of temperament here. I actually consulted for a short time with a company that works in virtual reality. And I spent long hours while I was on that job in virtual world. I was using the Oculus Rift system. If you haven't done it, I really recommend you do. Uh, it's, you could do it still at museums. I, I guess when those are open again, if you don't want to buy one. Um, it's really, really impressive. The technology is getting really good really quickly. When your hands are represented in the virtual worlds and you can interact with objects around you and you know things get really, really powerful. There's also social games too where you interact with people controlling avatars who look like floating robots. You know, it, and they could, they talk to you, you talk to them. You know, it, it, I imagine it must be something like the first audiences who saw movie theater projections. There's this famous story of one of the earliest silent black and white films, The Great Train Robbery and it's you know silent grainy black and white and it features a scene where one of the bandits points his gun directly at the screen or directly at the camera and, and fires it and there's you know reports of audience who saw this for the first time and they would yelp in their seats and hide behind theater seats and you know there was a kind of giddy delight in the powerful illusion that they were going through i imagine virtual reality technology at this point is sort of on that same precipice uh, I'm fascinated by the opportunities that this technology opens up, f not just for entertainment purposes or gaming purposes, but therapeutic and philosophically meaningful explorations. This show from Korea, Meeting You, clearly is in that field. And we're going to get into all of it in this episode with a conversation I had with Professor Candy Can who is an associate professor at Baylor University, and her field is comparative religions. And she also writes excellent books, which straddle the line between academic and popular writing. She wrote a book called Dying to Eat, but more relevant to this topic is a book that she wrote called Virtual Afterlives, which I reference often in our conversation. Uh, and as always, before we get into the interview, I want to give you a little bit of philosophy and framing before I play it. 
I think the most interesting question, which Candy and I discuss, involves the philosophical difference between virtual worlds and real worlds, if there is any at all. In our conversation, she points to the still imperfect aspects of the virtual technology, in particular on that show, and wonders if that imperfection is why it seems to work for her. To tie this idea to a bit of philosophy, I want to lean on a practice which comes from art traditions in the Navajo culture. The Navajo were, and still are, experts in rug weaving. They weave by hand with sort of wooden paddles that tamp down the patterns. And they make these beautifully symmetric patterns and geometric shapes in their rugs. But there's something unique about many Navajo rugs when you inspect them closely. There is a line of sort of an off color, which extends from a central plane of color on the rug to the edge of the rug. It's, it's a clear mistake. It looks like a clear mistake. Uh, and it's a deliberate one. It's a del- deliberate imperfection added by the weaver, by the artist. And they call the line the spirit line. There's a religious story around the line that it's a kind of escape route from the rug so as to not trap the soul of the rug maker themselves somewhere in the rug, I suppose. Obviously, I don't put any stock on the literal story here, but I find the secular analogy really fascinating. The imperfection on the rug is the path towards a retained humanity. Something too perfect, it seems, to the Navajo will entrap you. The Navajo were not the only culture to develop an art tradition which intentionally adds imperfections. And I think there must be some kind of secular wisdom to consider here. Obviously, the ancient Navajo rug weavers were not thinking of programming virtual reality experiences in particular, of grief and death. But perhaps if they were, they would consider adding a glitch or two to the experience as to not entrap the maker or the user in it. To err is human, is the classic phrase which comes to mind here. And death and grief is an inescapable part of the human experience, or at least it has been until now. Our technology is pushing the boundaries of all of these questions. So enjoy this conversation with a prominent scholar of the field as we start to scratch the surface here. Here's my conversation with Professor Candy Ken. All right, yeah, so we'll jump in. So yeah, so first I'm interested sort of just in your, I don't know, your field of of study in this particular um, area. I was a huge fan of the book, Virtual Afterlives. Um, It's actually inspiring me to write my own book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating. We're going to get into some of the details of it, but um, yeah, tell me your your view on it because I mean, just from my perspective, it's of course an eternal subject, the biggest mystery of death that we always seem to just not talk enough about. Uh, and then, I don't know, it, why did you write that book, I guess, in particular? So Virtual Afterlives came about because my cousin had an ex-boyfriend who had died and she was grieving his death and yet there was really no place for her. And in real life, that's actually the case, right? I mean, you, you have this dilemma, do you go to the funeral as an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend mm. or ex-spouse um or do you not go i mean you you don't want to intrude on the people who are now the primary grievers and and so she was having a difficult time mourning his death and and yet it was happening on facebook so it was a very different kind of way it was playing out and um so she's posted some stuff and then of course a new girlfriend took down some stuff mm, <laughs> and so that was really i mean, honestly that is what got me interested in this because i was like wow this has really changed the way people grieve and and the family was upset because they didn't have control over the story and the narrative and it made mm. me think about obituaries um and years later my brother died and my dad wrote this obituary and it was just so fascinating because it was really about my dad's role in my brother's life not about my brother i mean it's not at all the obituary that my brother would have written so it just was so interesting to me the way that death can kind of force these different narratives around the life and that was really kind of the background that got me interested in it yeah 
Wow, that's fascinating. So uh, I guess I should ask you, because I'll, I'll be introducing this from the, the, the topic in particular on this, what is your initial reaction to that VR show? I mean, when that it went a little semi-viral, this woman who's in terrible, ter- terrible grief being reunited with her daughter, like having, uh, it was like a, bir- a birthday cake that they shared together and stuff. I mean, very po- potent kind of things. And the reaction that I observed was extreme on both sides. I mean, half the people were like, this is a nightmare. How could you possibly, like, you know, dystopian future kind of thing. Maybe very exploitive. I mean, it's complicated by also that it was a TV show for profit. Um, and then the other half of like, this is incredible. And I'm, I'm so interested in it. And I would want this myself. I mean, what was your sort of initial reaction, especially as someone who studies this so closely to seeing this kind of manifestation of literally virtual afterlives as in that case? Yeah, so I actually just wrote a piece on it. Um, mm. I loved it. I thought it was great. And, and here's my takeaway is it's more an indication of how comfortable you are with technology and mm. where you fall in the technological spectrum. Um, I feel like initially people are like, oh, wow, that's a little bit hardcore and and that's probably not healthy. And in and, and the grief world, a lot of grief therapists will say, well, it's going to cause prolonged grieving. It might cause complicated grieving. But in watching it, if you've watched that TV show, the mother has a chance to revisit the setting and say the things that she never got to say to her daughter. Um, she tells her she loves her. She tells her she hopes she's doing well. Um, so, and, and then in the audience, of course, the dad's watching, the siblings are watching. And I feel like it's not unlike photography or videos. Um, and, and the reality is the technology is not that great, right? I mean, there's still glitches in the system. You, you, she's not responding in real time to this kind of stuff. You can tell that some of her responses to her mother were pre-planned and, and they don't exactly match what the mother says. So I feel like there's enough dissonance that it allows the person in the experience to really understand this is not real. Hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I thought it was more telling of where you fall in the tech technology world I mean, and how comfortable you are. Um, I, I I really think VR is going to be exploding over the next 10, 20 years as a tool. I have um, a friend who works for another company that uses uh, VR in the palliative care setting. Mm, so mm. they take them on these kind of meditative escapes and, and it diminishes the pain. It allows them to use a lot less um medical care and medical treatment um so i think vr has has huge potentials here and and you could use it in a therapeutic setting such as it's used um on this television show to kind of allow someone to go through this experience a traumatic experience to revisit with their deceased loved ones to have the opportunity to say these kind of things that you didn't get to say i can see the therapeutic value in that um yeah, so I think I think it's partly an, an indication of where you fall in terms of how comfortable you are in letting technology become a part of or slash invade your life. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at of the the maybe this seems like a like a too basic or juvenile question, but the mystery of death is is in just encapsulated, I think, by a, a, a rather stark branch in the way of think the way people think about life and philosophy and maybe consciousness in general, where it's either the body was just a vessel for something sacred or metaphysical, and then the body is you know sort of discarded or whatever it is, or the body is the actual there is no metaphysical there's no dualism it's just one thing and the body was the thing giving rise to the thing which almost ironically is like the first one sounds religious the first one sounds like the religious kind of standpoint of being like there's a soul and a body and they're intertwined and then death is the moment where those two things depart and therefore the body is sort of just this other you know shell like a shoebox that you had the thing you actually needed in it but upon closer inspection when you actually intertwine them and saying, no, the body is giving rise to this thing that we all sort of 
feel from the inside out as a sacred thing. Well, that means there is no separation at death. The thing just stops processing the soul or the consciousness or whatever it is. And therefore the thing itself retains some kind of weird, I don't know, essence or sacredness when it's gone. So what, what do we do with this particular body? So maybe I want to ask you about the, the part of your book where you talk about different cultures that treat the body differently. Cause that's drastically different still today with cultures. Some of them, um, you know, they stay in the home and you bathe them and you wash them. And in maybe places like uh, the United States or generally in the West, we've very much separated the body and the death from the living with a very like, you know, thick wall that we do not cross. I don't know if you if you mind philosophizing and investigating sort of those differences there. Yeah, so I definitely think that my background in comparative religions completely yeah. informed my work on and continues to inform my work on death and grief. Um, I don't think we can have a disembodied theology. For me, my entire experience of the living in the world is through my body. I, I am um, hard of hearing. I have only 20% of hearing in one ear. So all of my experience of the world comes through this sensory deficit and the, the better senses that I have in other places. Um, I'm a woman. Um, every one of my experiences has been filtered through the fact that I'm a woman. Um, yeah, so I don't think we can have this kind of disembodied theology at, at all. And I mm -hmm. think that yeah, and so you, you bring up another point in my book. I, I think a lot of my work is kind of a, a critique of Protestantism mm -hmm. through the lens of death and grief. Um, I feel like a lot of Protestant theology stresses this notion of resurrection, and then mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're one and done, you're resurrected, you die, you're gone. Um, <laughs> and, and so then, of course, people get told, oh, well, don't grieve because he or she is in a better place. Um, and that's really problematic because we do grieve. We grieve these empty spaces that are left behind in our worlds. Um, we grieve the absolute absence of someone. We grieve the lack of a continuing narrative to um, that person. And there's so many absences. And, and I think by just focusing on the positive notion of resurrection of the soul, we miss out on on what those absences can teach us the, the the values the suffering the you know so and i really believe that these absences allow us to have more presence and more of a, a place mm. for whatever our spirituality is a place for that to go and and so it carves us um it carves our souls so to speak so that we have more room um, but in terms of other cultures and other religions, I absolutely was transformed by my time in Korea, mm. um, my time mm. in Japan. In Korea, I lived with, I, I studied Korean studies for my undergraduate major. I now know nothing. <laughs> um, I could maybe bargain uh, in a store and, and order good, good Korean food. Those <laughs> two things I could still do. But uh, when I lived in, in Korea with my family in Taejeon, we went out for Chuseok out to the grave and we cleaned the grave mm. and we made offerings to the family. And, and it really struck me as a kind of a Thanksgiving, but with the deceased, it struck me as this kind of feasting, but including these many ancestors. And in Korea, the, the, burial mounds are beautiful there are these hills and so i kind of imagined all the mountains in korea being mm. built on the hills of these ancestors and it just was a magical time for me um and then in later in japan i went with my um my uh, japanese teacher to hokkaido she's from hokkaido and i stayed with her and her family and her father had recently died and so they had his tablet and um memorial in a in kind of a, a living room and uh i remember my teacher asking me are you going to be okay that's where we have the guest futon so you'll be sleeping in the room with my father and, and i just felt so delighted that she trusted me <laughs> enough to kind of keep him company for a night and uh yeah so i, I have these wonderful experiences where in Japan, you, you keep the memorial tablet up, you make offerings every day for 49 days, and then you make offerings on a less regular basis. 
um, for the year and then you move the tablet. So you, you have them with you in your home for a year after they've gone. So their material presence isn't necessarily the same, but they're still embodied in this memorial and you're still feeding them their favorite foods. If they smoke, you're offering them cigarettes. If they drink, you offer them, you know, their favorite drinks. So there's this way in which you really care for the dead and these other cultures that when my mom died, she actually died 23 years ago today. You know, I just felt that these were the customs I, I wanted. These were the customs I found healing, this kind of caring for the dead in a very material way in which the dead continue to be a part of your life and you continue to take care of them in their new altered state. I found that, you know, even in Catholic memorial services, you're regularly remembering the dead. You offer masses for the dead. Protestants, that's it. You're done. I mean, once the funeral's over, that's it. You go back to work and you may talk about them. You may post about them on Facebook, but there's no real requiem mass that is regularly used. And I felt like Protestants really were missing out on this opportunity to kind of insert the dead into their lives. And, and the more people I've talked to through my work, the more people that I have found that have just absolutely suffered because they haven't had yeah. some kind of material way to remember their loved ones. Yeah. Um, I don't mind bashing <laughs> Protestantism here. Cause, but, but, cause, well, I cause work I, at a Protestant university, so uh, well, that we'll, we'll, it's probably we'll be because I'm there yeah. that I can critique it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm so, and I go to a, a Baptist church. I mean, I'm an actively involved Protestant person. So, but that's why I can critique it because yeah. it really is. <laughs> Well, you could advocate for reform, I, I suppose, within. I mean, because I'm interested also in sort of the history of how maybe in the modern West, maybe this is a particular American question. Um, you know, the word Protestant, oftentimes we automatically just attach those next two words. The Protestant work ethic has become sort of the mm -hmm. buzzword in academia or philosophy of, if I'm sum summarizing it correctly, it's basically a a. Uh, from the pulpit sort of reimagining of the nativity and the teachings of Jesus and all of that to basically say that all of your hard work here on earth is what's actually punching your ticket to heaven. It's the toil that's actually sort of what's added up when you're at the gates with St. Peter. And if you've done enough, you get in. And it, and in a way, it was, if I'm getting my history correct, it sort of was a, a response in a way to merge with the very hyper kind of capitalist um, ethic that was taking over in America, which maybe a lot of churches realized was a threat in Protestantism, uh, maybe as a survival mechanism, was like, oh, wait, we have to weave that into what we're doing, and possibly with disastrous results for our, let's say, spiritual lives, as it were, as, as maybe we're pointing to here. Um, I don't know if that's a fair sort of retelling of America and why it, you could, maybe this sounds conspiratorial, but you can imagine if you were trying to set up a system that was designed to make an efficient money-making machine, you wouldn't want people doing inefficient things like feeding dead people. <laughs> because it's just a, it's a literal waste of resources of your own manpower and the food and everything else that's like a right. small example but expound that on a larger scale um and it seems that we've maybe taken that in america to some extreme end that that maybe maybe we're suffering from i don't even know if i have a question there or i'm just agreeing with your crit critique um and wondering how it might be unwindable in some ways uh maybe the question is because you wrote this book it's maybe what we definitely agree on or like people could sense is that there is some sort of dissatisfaction. You're talking about people suffering mm -hmm. in, in this tradition, feeling like the traditions on the shelf are there and it's nice that they're kind of there in the moment, but, but we want something more, whether it's something as simple, maybe you could talk about the simple act of getting a tattoo for a loved one, just that simple practice. What's the dissatisfaction that people seem to be expressing? Why are we looking for more out of our so death rituals? I, I would jump in there and say that Protestantism is, is largely what leads to secularism too, right? So when I'm talking about a critique on Protestantism, I'm also talking about a critique on secularism. And Talal Assad really draws those kind of lines very nicely, um, showing how Protestantism is the mechanism through which we become a secular society. Um, and he does it in, in the context of, well, it's really hard to talk about Islamic states when you're not actually secular or post-secular. But 
I think you can kind of take that then. And that's part of the problem with grief is that we're expected to do grief work or we're expected to move through stages and, and Americans particularly love stages, right? I mean, they love like working through things or task lists. And mm -hmm. so part of my issue with it is that even if you're not religious, even if you're just influenced by this secular cultural society, it's still problematic because you, you're you're not given the permission by society, and, and we can go all into that, right? So the lack of bereavement, mm -hmm. uh, mm, yeah, laws in the United States. I mean, there's so much stuff there, but as a result, you're not given permission to actually grieve, and and you're not allowed to grieve. You're expected to get over it or move on, which I think is crazy. I mean, one of the big things with grief is that you know it's it's we're not allowed to grieve things um pet deaths i think are really traumatic and and child and baby death i mean mm. this is the area where i mean i feel like there's so many unspoken unnamed deaths there are so many women who have had miscarriages um who have no place to talk about it yeah. And just the language people use surrounding these deaths. Oh, she became an angel in heaven. Well, how, what? You know, I mean, that's still this huge loss. Your landscape is absolutely shifted. Your world looks completely different. And the future you imagined is gone. So it's not just a loss of the actual person or the animal, but it's the way your entire world now operates very differently. And, and so I think we have a serious problem with um, kind of marginalized grief and the fact that people don't want to talk about it. And, and only people who have pets really understand how huge the loss of that pet is. And um, yeah, so I, I think there's all kinds of problems that come as a result of this kind of notion of grief and what you're supposed to feel and what you're not supposed to feel. And the fact that we even, have these notions of what you should be or shouldn't be feeling. Yeah. Can, can you break, break down those, those classic, uh, I forget her name now, the one who, who introduced these stages of grief. Although I think, isn't there some weird, like she didn't mean to do it on purpose or it's been misinterpreted. What is that? Is it the first no, is it's denial? Really and... Cause Elizabeth Kubler Ross, we just That's celebrated, the... um, her, the 50 year anniversary of her book. Mm. Um, and it was a huge on, uh, on death and dying and it was a huge influence in our culture and i'm very grateful to her and her work um because she really does bring the death conversation to our culture and she allows people to start talking about it but her book was written about the stages of dying mm. and so it's not written about grief it's written about the actual process of dying so denial anger bargaining um you know eventually you get to acceptance but the whole idea then this gets misapplied to the stages of grief mm. um and then people tell themselves oh i must not be grieving correctly because i haven't moved through these stages and in reality those stages were applied to dying not to actually grieving um and so it, it's really hard Additionally, there are stages, right? So you're supposed to move through them. And, and the, the implied thought there is that you come out on the other side, a new and improved human being. And uh, that's not the way grief works. I mean, you know, it, grief is unsettling. It's, um, it comes at times you least expect it. Grief compounds grief. So every loss you have will amplify the last loss you had. Um, grief is, it leaves a, an absence in, in your wake. And, you know, some deaths are really traumatic, basically, you know, depending on the type of death, right? Whether it was expected or unexpected, whether it was a murder or an accident, um, depending on the age of the person who died. Also, depending on what happens afterwards. I mean, did the family have a huge falling out? So, death really reorganizes and reorders your world as well. And that's the part that isn't discussed enough. I mean, death can really just completely destroy a family. 
Um, and, and so you're not just talking about one thing that changes. You're talking about an entire system that suffers change. And some of those changes can be good, but a lot of them are really quite traumatic. And, and so um, there's a bunch of work that has been done since on grief and uh I will stop there. Before, yeah, yeah. Before you to hear. No, no, no. I mean, what, so what are some of the, I know you wrote about some in the book, but what are some of the more creative or innovative ways you've seen using sort of new technology like the show Meeting You that we're sort of talking about here? What else have you seen in this space that sort of excites you or interests you as maybe um, a step in the right direction? Or maybe the other ones, maybe there's things that you think are just horrible mistakes that we're making. So I love the new technologies, but I think it's partly because I'm an optimist. So I kind of see the positives of what can happen with technology. Um, and it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. So, I mean, we just have to learn to figure out how to do this in the right way, right? And then there's a whole transhumanism movement. So there's a group, um, Life Knot, where you can mm. basically upload your consciousness online, but they also do biofiles where you can send them a DNA sample that costs a little bit of money. You can, you can upload your consciousness for free, but the bio file costs like $250 or something. And then um, eventually they want to clone your bio file and then match it to your uploaded consciousness. Um, so there's these really interesting transhumanism movements and, and they're deeply embedded in the whole technology world. So uh, that one was started, for example, by, um the same people who started Sirius XM. So they have access to all this venture capital money. Um, they're very connected in the technology world. And there's a whole bunch of Silicon Valley people who are actually really into transhumanism. Um, I, I think this is an area that I'm really watching. Uh, and, and there's so many ethical conundrums there and, and issues. The interesting thing about transhumanism for me is that one of the ways they advertise the making of a, of a transhumanist self is that it can function as a grief bot. So you should upload yourself. You'll be able to help your grandchildren deal with your death when you die. You'll be online and you can give them advice when you're no longer around. So there's this weird like mix of death denial yeah. that <laughs> that's mixed with like we're gonna help you and your your progeny learn how to deal with death. I find that very fascinating. Um, this kind of you know intersection, but transhumanism is one of the areas I'm really watching. I would say with COVID nineteen, we're going to see a huge jump in um, technology in general. So I'm part of a group. Um, there's eighty of us, different researchers and scholars, and funeral home directors, clergy, um, medical personnel. And we put together um, a COVID paper. It's called uh, covidpaper.com. And uh, we put together a group of resources that can be used, like if you have someone who's dying in a hospital and you can't be there in person, mm -hmm. or someone has died and you want to hold a virtual funeral, how, what are some types of things that you can do? Um, so I think COVID-19 is, is going to, and already is, making us jump years ahead in the future. People who are resistant to learning these technologies or people who thought they didn't need to learn them um, are now being forced to learn all these different types of technologies wow. and utilize them. And so I love that because I feel like we're jumping ahead here in ways um, people are becoming much more um, literate, te technology literate, and, and that's exciting to me. There's a lot of, it's certainly there's the crowd who wants to conquer death and just questions the whole like notion and the transhumanist movement, or I, I've investigated some of these things with the rad fest and the radical extension of life movement. And, and you meet some real wackos in there, but you also meet some fascinating people. Um, but as far as the people who are just trying to, well, deny or conquer death, however they would say it, uh, what about just about on grief and technology dealing with grief? So things like this VR kind of thing yeah. or the chat bot. I mean, what else have you seen there? I, I could share some of the things that I've poked around on. I'm, you know, I'm into the subject very, very deeply at the moment. So I've been reading, actually, when you were talking about the miscarriages and stuff, I was reading about um, this family, sort of beautiful, who 
uh, lost a baby. Like, I don't know, f- some 40 something weeks or whatever, but it was, it was difficult for her. And they use, I don't know if you've seen these guys, I think it's bio bios urn and it's, the ashes are mixed with a biodegradable um, tree uh, seedling that they send you back. And so now like whatever, some of the carbon I suppose is in the tree mm-hmm. and they're continuing to like raise their daughter is what they say with, and feed and nourish this literal tree that they can travel around with, um, which is their miscarried baby, things like that, uh, which isn't even, it's a technology that's being used. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what else you've come across in sort of the the upgrade when it comes from you write about uh, t-shirts funeral t-shirts and stuff which which uh, in my experience in west africa is still hugely popular when someone dies it's like t-shirts and a parade through the town um tattoos of course you write about and the the sort of wearing the dead i'm not sure if you've come across anything else in in that in that space or, or there's things that you think we're going to be doing soon with VR. There's lots of things you can do to dispose of the dead. Um, Have you seen the mushroom suit thing? Huh? Have you seen this mushroom suit? I think it's called like the infinity suit where your body biodegrades and then mushrooms grow out of it. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing. Yeah. And one of my favorite um, coffin uh, companies is called Crazy Coffins, and they make like these gorgeous coffins. They they were inspired by Ghana, of yes, course, yeah. where you do these beautiful coffins. But um, so you can turn them into diamonds. You can turn them into paintings. You can mix mm. the ashes with the the paint. You can make them into records. Um, records. Like they press it, it on a vinyl or something. Yeah. Yeah, wow. so you could like take the playlist and make a record with the ashes <laughs> of the person and make it. so that's kind of cool. Wow. You can do um I like rocks. There's a company called Parting Stone, which I just love. They they make these little rocks. Um my daughter is not into the rocks. As I told her I just want to be rocks and <laughs> five hundred bucks and it costs hardly anything. And then they're like little pebbles, so they don't look like anything. And she's like, I don't want a bunch of rocks, mom. And so I think she's more into the diamond thing. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. the diamond thing is cool because you can choose the color of the person's eyes or the dog's eyes. You can choose the color of a horse's coat. I mean, so you can like literally turn um, a living being into a diamond and wear that. You can also, there's a couple glass memorial companies that will... Hmm inter the you know you, you turn the carbon into glass and and then they become this gorgeous glass sculpture the nice thing about these kind of companies is that um you can have the dead with you but it doesn't necessarily make people feel uncomfortable right mm. so my mom i told you she died 23 years ago we moved her hmm. about i don't know about seven or eight years ago to a new spot and her old urn didn't fit because they had like custom urns. So we had to take her ashes out of one urn and put them in another. So, but I didn't want to just toss the urn away because I was like, might have residual mom in it. So I have that in my closet because I don't know where else to put it. Right. And I don't want to make people uncomfortable. So <laughs> I just keep that in the closet. But that's kind of what happens with ashes over time if you don't have a place. So the nice thing about these new forms of disposal, is they allow you to have a memory without necessarily having to have a conversation or, or having to earn on the mantle. And, um, there was a really cool, but talking about technology, there was a really cool game a couple of years ago called that dragon cancer. Yeah. I, I know it well. Yeah. Explain the game. I mean, it's beautiful and heartbreaking. Have you played it? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I haven't I played it. it. So yeah. tell me, tell, tell us about it. Well, so it was a, let's see if I get this right. It was a couple whose child died of cancer and he was very young um, maybe three, I might be getting those details wrong, maybe even younger. It was like a, he was fighting child cancer. They thought he was going to get better and not. And then the, the couple, uh, who are both video game designers designed and built this virtual game that really, it has no, it's not, you know, the name is kind of ironic with the history of video games and slaying the dragon at the end or whatever. But of course the dragon is this metaphor for cancer and this thing that's taking this kid away. And you really just kind of wander around their memories with, with a bit of a curated sort of order that happens to it. You wander around their memories and you're interfacing with this baby. They use the actual audio of like the baby's laugh and all this kind of stuff. And um, you hear him talking and it's all, it's a bunch of like mini games, very simple things. Like you have to order his um, mobile, 
wheel above his crib and things mm-hmm. like that. And if anyone's a gamer out there and remembers the games like Seventh Guest or any of those kind of weird, um, escape, it's sort of like an escape the room kind of mini games within it that get you to the next scene. But you're always just advancing deeper and deeper into the story. Some of it's in like doctor's waiting rooms and that kind of stuff. And at the end, he's, I won't ruin it, but obviously it doesn't end very, you know, he, he doesn't live. Uh, he sort of just drifts away. Um, and it won some uh, big awards. It won right? big awards. They won like the biggest awards for like the game of the year and stuff. And it's not like the most beautifully, you know, uh, artistic game, but there's just something obviously so sacred about it. It's, it's pretty effective. You feel like you're in the memories of other people's grief um, and you should be very, very careful in it. Um, so yeah, but, but the question there of as a tool for grief and as a tool for burial and ritual, I'm, I'm fascinated with it. I don't know. I just spoke for a while. I don't know if you have, you've thought about this, the difference between the virtual world versus the real world. And if there is one or if it matters, I don't know. We spend so much of our time online though, Jay, like, or, or in these virtual worlds that they are part of our reality. Right. I mean, that's the whole, I don't. Again, I think here you're going to see people divide by how comfortable they are with mm. technology. And one of the things I, I've been working on is a smartphone memorials, which is interesting because now all this stuff is moving from just being online to actually being in our phones, right? Um, and again, that depends on where you are contextually and the role it's going to play. But I love the idea of building memorials um, in these games. Hey, yeah. I... One of my big suggestions for parents, for kids, is if they're playing like Minecraft, let them build a memorial in Minecraft. Let them mourn online in the worlds and spaces that they're really comfortable being in. Um, and that's kind of what it is for me. I, I don't see it as fragmented. It is a part of who we are now. Mm. Um, but I want to ask you, Jay, this is kind yeah. of random. Have you had a dream with your technology in it? Um. Well, all the time when I, I'm an editor post-production. So if I'm editing a project, I end up dreaming inevitably about a timeline and Premiere <laughs> Pro and all that. I mean, it just, you can't not, um, I'm trying to think of other technology. When I was really using the VR for a while, actually, here's one. When I was using the VR for a while, I don't remember the name of this game. I wish I could give them credit. There's some, some horror games in VR that are really actually frightening, like genuinely frightening. There's this game that's sort of a role-playing game where you're, um, you're in the body of, I think it's a woman who's like investigating the disappearance of maybe her, her lesbian lover. It's a really fascinating game. It's in like the, the Southwest and it's desert landscape and stuff. And this demon is haunting you. And be, I'll just explain it to you because it's so frightening. I wish I knew the name now. I could give them credit. Um, but because you could program, of course, in virtual reality where the user is looking, they programmed this demon to be that if you look at it too long, it comes and kill, it kills you. So you'll hear the thing when you look and you'll look over, but you have to quickly turn away. But then you could hear it. And the temptation to look at it again is so strong. But every time you look at it, it comes It's just a a brilliantly designed game, but I remember having nightmares, literally. I mean, the graphics aren't even that good. It's like a black blob, but like nightmares about that. So there you go. That was very real to me. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I've only had two dreams where my phone has been in the dream. I've never had another dream where I've actually used my technology. I never used my phone in a dream. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird, right? Like, I I think, and and to me, like, I remember the very first dream I had with my phone in it. And I woke up, I was so shocked that my phone had found its way into my dreaming world. And and that's, so, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, these things come But with with these games and with these virtual worlds, maybe I'm asking about the danger. If If that line is lurking, that we're foolishly, you know, like Icarus towards the sun, just going somewhere where we actually can't go, where we're trying to fully recreate, resurrect. I mean, the temptation... In the in that show meeting you, obviously that people might feel is that like, oh, you're trying to bring her back. You're trying to it's sacrilegious in some even secular way to bring people back because you just can't. You cannot simulate them fully. Um, but I, you know, I don't I don't know if that's more of a question about a de- death denial versus a grief sort of therapeutic usage. Um, but obviously that's maybe that's the line I'm looking for that. If there is a danger, that's the cross where therapeutic uses of grief become denials of death 
through our technology because it's just so immersive and convincing that you could get lost in these worlds forever. Yeah, and and there is that story when you look up this um, South Korean VR clip, you, you also get this other story of a couple that stopped feeding their children because they were spending so much time online yeah, with yeah. their like virtual. So I think it's possible, but that's more something that happens with a person, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, when you watch this clip, it's just not reality. I mean, there's too many glitches. She's not accurate. Her her eyes aren't looking. I don't know. But is but there are those solvable danger? problems? Yeah. Like, is that yeah. are those just all like, well, we'll we'll get better at it, and then and then what? But do we want to get better? I mean, for me, so I discovered a long time ago. Like, my favorite thing is you know when you eat something and it just doesn't quite have enough salt on it. There's something just slightly missing. But that's perfection to me because it's just slightly missing enough that you notice it. Mm -hmm. But when you like when it's perfect, you just you don't even notice it. Right. So there's this like beauty in this slight imperfection that for me is exactly what you want. But yeah. So is there a danger as we continue to perfect these technologies? I think there could be. But I think that is more resides with the person and their desire to escape reality. And that's why I think we have to talk about how devastating death can be and how absolutely sad grief can be. And, and, and I think without those conversations, if you're just going for the death denial side or the kind of resurrecting people virtually side, then I think you do miss something. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you just on the way it hits me too, though. Like that show I find to be really, um, well, maybe I'll just ask you directly. Would you want to do that for your, your mother 23 years ago or your brother now? Would you, do you have any resistance if, if I was like, Hey, I built them in VR. I want to go say hi. I think, no, I think for me, I'd rather like dig up their ashes and make a diamond out of them or, mm. or, you know, I'd rather have them the way they are now. Cause yeah, I will say when my brother died, I had just erased a voicemail from him the day before. Mm. Um, and then I called the, the telephone company and I asked him, is there any way that you can get this voicemail back because I deleted it and he's just died. And, and you know, I would not have deleted it had I known because I would have had his voice on my and uh, they said no. So I was really bummed. And so for a few years, um, his girlfriend kept his phone and kept his voicemail on it. And for a few years, I would just call at random times. She would let it ring because she knew I wasn't calling to talk to her. I was calling to listen to his voicemail just because I wanted to hear his voice. So mm -hmm. there's definitely, um, there's something beautiful about, you know, having those kind of memories, but they weren't in that world, you know, the virtual reality world. So for me, that wouldn't hold, I think if I gamed with someone and then, you know, that was the space I knew them really well in. I, I think for me, it's about the space that you know them and the space that they occupy in your imagination or mm. in your head. Um, yeah, so it would just be odd. I, I, I don't... You were talking about those really cool, like, uh, memorials, like the hair and stuff. I don't know yeah. if you heard, I don't remember what it was called, but in the Civil War period, they had these little glass tubes and you would cry in them. Oh, I don't know. This so one. melodramatic. And then you would stop her them. And then when the tears evaporated, your mourning was over. Oh, wow. I love that. And I actually saw one, but it cost $250. I mean, it was just this glass vial. And I'm like, I wanted it so bad, but I was just not going to spend that much money on it. But it was cool. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, cool. Well, I'll let you go. I actually okay. got to get back to some other less interesting work. There is much more in Candy's book that is worth exploring. She writes about um, ghost bikes and all kinds of other ways of memorializing. It's clear that she nor I are bothered or have much trepidation about using VR to explore grief or anything like the Meeting You show. As I mentioned at the top of the interview, I am actually writing on this subject, so my mind is swimming with a lot of this topic at the moment. And I'm in contact with several companies who are doing really interesting things with death and grief uh, and technology. One of them is Eterneva. 
Uh, they're one of the companies that grows diamonds from the carbon of the deceased. They do pets and loved ones and everything else. Uh, her company was actually featured on Shark Tank. I recorded a conversation with the founder. Her name is Adele Archer. Uh, and it was really good. I intended to include it in this episode, but I just didn't think it quite fit. Uh, but it's still pretty excellent. So I'm going to put that up on my website if anybody's interested. Uh, the website is whatjthinks.com. Um, and I'll put it on the Dilemma page. You can find it at dilemmapodcast.com as well. Um, so you could look for that. And uh, now my final thoughts on virtual afterlives and the show Meeting You. There are so many ways to talk about this thing. From an ethical perspective, there's obvious questions of consent with the virtual representations and resurrections. Um, There's the psychological health aspect and the responsibility to help usher people through these experiences and craft them in a way as to not push them further into unwise or unhelpful grief. Uh, There ought to be some kind of aftercare for experiences like this. I think it's unfair to pass any kind of strong moral judgment on the show from Korea itself without knowing these details, Uh, so I don't know exactly what they did. Uh, But there are certainly ways that it could be exploitative and ways that it could be uh, beneficial, in my view. So what I want to leave this episode with is another plea for you to seek out and explore virtual reality technology. A lot of it's on the shelf now, and it's pretty good. Uh, This is not the the sort of hardware iteration that will sweep the world. It's still heavy on your face, and you get sweaty. Uh, You don't have a full angle for your field of vision, but it's getting better and wider and more high definition. And the computers that are required to run like the really immersive stuff are a bit expensive. It's like gaming laptops and gaming computers. But it's it's getting there, and it's doable, and you could find these things. So if you get your, your head and hands in one of these, I think within the first minute, you have this thought of, oh yeah, you know, the bulldozer, the virtual reality bulldozer is coming for us pretty soon. And the the big philosophical question here that lurks beneath everything is whether a virtual world and a real world are at all different. Is an input of pixels different from an input of atoms if the effect of them is indistinguishable? And to really answer that question, we're going to have to tackle the consciousness conversation. I'm not going to do that here, obviously, because I have a string of episodes that I've recorded that take this on directly. And I'm going to want to revisit this fundamental question after you've heard them. And after you hear me go through a bit of a live transformation in my conception of consciousness in one of those episodes. So the next episodes coming up for this season are a two-part episode with Keith Frankish, who is an advocate for what he calls illusionism as a theory of consciousness, and an episode with the popular street artist Caledonia Curry, who also goes by the name Swoon, where we wonder what art is and if computers or machines are capable of generating art autonomously. Those two subjects are obviously intertwined with the philosophical issues surrounding the show Meeting You. So I'm going to save my true thoughts for those. But first, next week, I'm doing kind of a special emergency episode that is a departure from these, you know, sometimes esoteric philosophical conversations. It's an episode about the situation of the Uyghur Muslim genocide unfolding in China. I'm talking to Rahima Mahmoud from the World Uyghur Congress And, you know, sometimes I feel like we just have to drop everything and talk about something like that. So I'm going to push that one out with some urgency early next week. Um, So find me next week and stay safe out there.